Good morning, church. Do you realize that when I say good morning, church, I'm talking to you? The church, sometimes we get this a little bit confused. The church is not the building. The church is not the place. The church is the people. And I praise the Lord that his church has gathered here this morning. So this is the gathering of the Trailhead Christian Fellowship Church on Sunday, September, whatever it is, 2018. The last week has been a little, of a, little bit of a blur. I appreciate, as Tom mentioned, let's continue to pray for Sally and for her family. Just shocking what happened this past week. One day, Dave was in church shaking my hand, and the next day, he's with the Lord. Um, so, continue to be in prayer for her and her family. Would you turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 40? The book of Isaiah, chapter 40. If you don't have a Bible with you here today, you will find it in your pew Bibles on page 548. Unless you have that rogue Bible, and then I can't help you. Um, <laughs> but I believe it should be on page 548 in your pew Bibles. We are taking a, a little bit of a, a break from the Colossians series this morning. We will get back into that next week. I've got a two-part message that I want to share with you today. Last week I had two parts, and I figured I might as well do two parts in this week. The first part is going to be Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 through 31. The Lord is the everlasting God. He is the everlasting God. And what does that mean for us here today? The second part of my message is going to be about baptism. And you might be saying, what? Why is he going to talk about baptism? Next week, we, are, we have the privilege of witnessing the baptism of Gene Fields. Gene, are you here? I saw him before church started. Okay. Um, Gene is going to be baptized next week, Sunday, God willing. We're going to do it out here on the cement. It's going to be part of the service, kind of. Um, but we are going to witness that next week. As long as we have the water in the horse stock tank, we're going to use a stock tank to baptize him. As long as we have the water in there and as long as it's heated, if anyone else wants to be baptized, I want you to come and talk to me after the service today or you can contact me during the week. Now what I need to hear from you, if you're interested in being baptized, I need to hear that you have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not going to baptize anyone who is not trusting Christ for salvation. I want to just put that out. At, I want to put that out here for you right now, just so you don't have any misunderstanding about that. But if you have not been baptized and you would like to be baptized next week, and you can give credible reason for me to believe that you have trusted Christ for salvation, and it's not that hard. It really isn't that hard. I'm not trying to make it out more than what it is. But if you're trusting Christ for salvation and would like to be baptized, we would like to do that next week. Okay? Enough said. I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. But first, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 through 31. This is the word of the Lord. When I'm finished saying this passage, when I'm finished reading this passage— I'm going to say the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. And then what are you going to say? Thanks be to God. Would you do that with me? And actually, would you stand up with me as I read this text in reverence? Sorry, if you're tired, that's okay. You don't have to. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27. The Lord speaking. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? And my sight or my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't grow faint or weary. His understanding is unsearchable. 
He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. Would you bow your heads one more time in prayer with me? Dear Father, as we look into your word this morning, as we hear it proclaimed, Father, would you move in our hearts? Would you work in us? We praise you that your word is living and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. Dear Father, we praise you that your word does not return to you void, but accomplishes what you desire and succeeds in the matter for which you sent it. Lord, would you accomplish your purposes in our lives this morning through this word from you. And dear Lord, even though we're in the Old Testament this morning, I pray that we would see Christ. That, see, that we would see that ultimately this is about Christ. Would you help us with that? In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. You may go ahead and have a seat. This might seem to be a really, really strange passage for us to be taking a look at today. But this week, as I prepared for the funeral or the memorial service of Dave Wasseen, this is the passage that Sally asked us to read yesterday. And so I spent some time studying it, going through it, and at first I thought, it's, it, it doesn't seem like that applicable for a, a memorial service. And then the more that I studied it, the more I thought, this is perfect. This is absolutely perfect for a memorial service. In fact, it's perfect for anyone who's going through suffering, anyone who's going through pain, anyone who feels like, I'm waiting on the Lord. Where are you, Lord? Why are you not moving on my behalf? Verse 27, if you'll look there with me in your Bibles, it's going to help us to understand this context. Oftentimes, you probably hear verses 28 through verse 31 read. You've probably, you've probably heard it quoted many, many times. But oftentimes, what, lets, what gets left off is verse 27. That's so helpful for, for us to understand the context. It says this, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? And my right is disregarded by my God. Now, if we had time to really think about what's going on in this text, we would realize that it's during the time of the Jews' captivity in Babylon. Do you remember that? In the year 586 before Christ, the Jews, because they had been disobedient over and over and over and over and over again, right? They had been disobedient to the Lord. They had disregarded his prophets, the mouthpieces that the Lord had sent. And so the Lord delivers them into captivity. They were disciplined by God for years and years of disobedience. Now, if you study the Old Testament, you have to know that the Jews were waiting for a deliverer. They were waiting for a king who would sit on David's throne forever and ever, right? And so they're expecting, we can't stay here in captivity. That can't be part of God's plan, right? They knew their scriptures. They knew that that wasn't ultimately what God had for them. Basically, the Jews here are saying, where are you, God? Do you see that in the text in verse 27? They're saying, where are you, God? Why have you not come to save us? We, we're your chosen people. We're the ones who you promised to Abraham to bless the whole world through. They're saying, where are you, God? Why can't we see you moving and working on our behalf? Does that sound familiar to any of you? Where are you, God? I don't see you moving here. I don't see you working. My way seems hidden from the Lord. My right seems disregarded by my God. 
The prophet Isaiah is speaking to God's people as his mouthpiece. And what he's doing here is he's attempting to give them comfort and hope even in the midst of their pain and loss. He's giving them comfort and hope by reminding them of who God is. And that takes us to verse 28. Verse 28 says this, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't grow faint. He doesn't faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Let me just take a moment to unpack that. He says the Lord is the everlasting God. That means the Lord has no beginning and no end. Right? No beginning, no end. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Though all else changes, God never does. Do you believe that? Though all else changes, God never does. Our lives, as we've even seen this week, our lives are temporary. They're but a mist. They're but a vapor, right? But God, get your mind around this one, God exists outside of time. Seriously, just think about that for a moment and try not to let your mind be blown. God exists outside of time. Cre- Oops. He created time. That's what this passage starts with. God is the everlasting God. The second phrase there, the creator of the ends of the earth. All that we see, and again, I was just telling someone yesterday at the memorial service, this is, this is a beautiful, beautiful place. Right, Carol? We've got a visitor here this weekend from Spokane, and, and she's just raving about how beautiful it is here. And we agree. Uh, and the, the location of this building, again, it's not, the building isn't the church, but the location of this building, it, it, it couldn't, I don't think it could be better. Um, all that we see and all that we don't see was created by God. Now it stands to reason that if he created it, he also rules over it. Think about that for a moment. If he created it, he rules over over it. That makes sense, doesn't it? I think that's pretty logical to make that connection. I think there are many, many other scripture passages that tell us this as well. If he created it, he rules over it. He is sovereign, and we need to continue with this line of thinking. If he rules over it, then he's sovereign over all that takes place. What does that mean, that he's sovereign? Well, we could spend a long time talking about that one. But basically, it says he's in control. He is in control. Now, remember who is being spoken to here. God's people, the Jews, who have been taken into captivity. What a word, what a word of encouragement this would be for them. God is sovereign over all. Remember, he's the everlasting God. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. God is using even this, even this pain, even this trial to accomplish his good purposes. That's what it means that God is sovereign. He's using everything that happens in our lives, though we don't oftentimes understand it. He's using it to accomplish his good purposes. When my brother died of cancer in 2003, he was using it for his good purposes. I don't understand all the reasons, but if I study scripture, I have to come to that conclusion. God is using it somehow. Look with me at the next section. It says he doesn't, now it's speaking of God, he doesn't faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. First of all, he doesn't faint or grow weary. He has no physical limitations like we do. How many of you would love to not ever be tired? Oh, Lord. Lord. What a day that'll be, right, when we are in the presence of God for eternity? And we don't have to eat to to nourish our bodies. We will eat. There'll be a feast, right? It'll be a feast. It's the wedding supper of the Lamb that we're going to celebrate together. But we will not have to eat to sustain ourselves. 
right? We're not going to need sleep because we're going to be feeding on the glory of the Lord for all eternity. God, though we tire and though we grow weary, God never does. Once again, encouraging for the Jews who were hearing this when they were in captivity. The next phrase, his understanding is unsearchable. His understanding is unsearchable. Again, the Jews, imagine, God, why are you doing this? We cannot see your plan here. Isaiah 55 says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways. Romans chapter 11, one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture, one of my favorite sections in all of Scripture, verse 33 through 36, it starts with this, Oh, the riches of the depth of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor. What that's saying is, we don't understand his ways, but we can trust that he is good, and that what he's working out is good. Verse 28 is a reminder of who God is. Verse 29 talks about what he does. It says, he gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Verse 30, even you shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What I believe that those verses are communicating to God's people, which is us now, is those who seek to live in or by their own strength will fail. Those who seek to live in or by their own strength will ultimately fail. The Lord alone provides true strength. But it begs the question, doesn't it? How does the Lord provide true strength? How does the Lord provide true strength today? I believe that what the Lord is communicating to the Jews in this text is don't Fear, your deliverer will come. The deliverer will come. Ultimately, you will be restored from captivity back into your land. And I believe that what it says to us is, don't fear, your deliverer has come. Who is the deliverer? The deliverer is Jesus Christ. The one who sets us free, Diane, if you're still here, that was incredible. She might have gone home. Oh, she's still here. Good to see you, Diane. That, that was fantastic. We have to be delivered because we have a sin problem. I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, right? But we know that our sin has separated us from God. And we know because we, we've, most of us have heard this before. That Christ came so that we could be reconciled to the holy God, the holy, just God who demanded that justice be done. And the truth was that justice was served by Christ. It can't be served by us. The deliverer has come. He has come to make it possible that we be reconciled to God. And so that's my question for you here today is, do you believe that? Not only in your head, has it made the journey from your head to your heart? The 18-inch journey or whatever that's known as, has it made its way to your heart? Christ, the Deliverer, has come. And you might be saying, yeah, but I'm still, I, there's, there's pain, there's hardship, there's I'm tired all the time. I, I'm dealing with health struggles. I, there, there's just trouble all around me. It, the, you watch the news. It doesn't matter what station it is. It's all negative, negative, negative. Who can we trust anymore? Remember, the deliverer has come. And remember, he will come again. The deliverer will come again. That 
is where our strength comes from, brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what strengthens me. That's what needs to strengthen me. I got to admit, I was tired this morning. <laughs> I was complaining to some folks back there before the service. I didn't mean to be complaining. I was just trying to be honest. Um, and I wear my heart on my sleeve. If you ask me how I am, I'm going to tell you exactly how I am. Probably to a fault. But that's the reason that I need to preach this message this morning. This is what gives me strength. This is what should give us strength. As a church corporately, but as individuals, the Deliverer has come, and He will come again. Do you trust Him? I feel like I need to pray and then talk about baptism. Is that okay with you all? Let me pray. Lord, I praise you for this word. Dear Father, we praise you for the hope that it gives us. I praise you for the strength that it gives us. I believe this is what the Lord was communicating to Jew the Jews. Hold on. Hold on. The Lord is the everlasting God. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He's the one who's in control. He's using even this, even this hardship, even this unspeakable pain, even this time in captivity for his good purposes. And dear Lord, I believe you're saying the same thing to us today. The Deliverer has come. And that's how we're different than the Jews. The Deliverer has come. He's come to set us free. He's come to, to set us free from our sin problem. To set us free from our depravity. Our depraved hearts. That without Christ are incapable of doing anything good. Of doing anything pleasing to the Spirit. But we praise you for this truth. We praise you for the great news of Jesus Christ. We praise you that he has come, and we praise you that he is coming again. Dear Father, would you help us to encourage each other with these words? Lord, even as it says in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, encourage each other with these things. Speak this to each other. He will come again with the loud trumpet and the voice of the archangel. He's going to come again. So Lord, I pray that we would hold on knowing that you are the one holding on to us. We praise you for this time today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just, I, I, have, to, I have to say some things about baptism. The baptism that's going to take place next week, Sunday, once again outside of church here. In case, and I don't know, I don't know what your understanding is of baptism. I, I'm still learning your names for Pete's sake. <laughs> so I don't know what you understand or believe about baptism. So, so please just humor me for a little bit. You might be saying, duh, we knew all this already. But I feel like in order to make sure that we're all in the same, that we're all in the same place, I, I need to just spend a few moments talking about baptism. The best illustration that I think we can find about baptism is a wedding ring. If you're married, you're probably wearing one of these right now. If you're not, you're probably not. Um, the wedding ring doesn't mean, let me say that again, the wedding ring doesn't make a person married. Did you know that? The wedding ring doesn't make a person married. What it is, is it's a symbol of our marriage. 
Do you understand that? It, I, I think I lost a few of you. I think it just, did, did it go right over? Um, the wedding ring doesn't make a person married. It's a symbol that we are married. It's the same with baptism. It's the same with baptism. Baptism does not make a person a Christian. The Bible does not teach that you have to be baptized in order to have salvation. Salvation is through faith in Christ alone. There are some confusing passages that seem to maybe be a little bit conflicting, but we could take some time. We don't have time this morning, but if we had more time, we could take it to really study those and see that's not what's being commanded here. Um, This is an act of obedience that follows our union with Christ. The union that we have with Christ is because of our faith. It's not because of our baptism. Are you with me? (laughs) Nod your heads if you're not. Um, Okay. Baptism is not union with Christ, but it symbolizes that union that comes through faith in Christ. So the the, the purpose of water baptism is that it's a public profession of one's commitment to Christ. A declaration before the world that a person has put his trust in Christ and intends to follow him. It identifies a new believer's association with Christ as it pictures the gospel. That's what baptism is. It's a picture of the gospel. Romans chapter 6 tells us. It, it's a picture of being buried with Christ as we go under the water and being raised with Christ to new life as we come up out of the water. It, it's, a, it's an incredibly vivid picture. A lot like the Lord's table is an incredibly vis- vivid picture of what Christ did for us on the cross. That's the reason they're sacraments. That the, that's the reason that Christ told us to do these things. These two things. Right? Is because it's a picture of the gospel. Baptism is done as an act of obedience to Jesus' command in Matthew 28, verse 19, to be baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Who should be baptized, you might say? Who should be baptized? Anyone who believes who has not been baptized as a believer. Does that make sense? Anyone who has not been baptized as a believer, and like I said, can can give me credible evidence of their faith in Jesus Christ, which is tough sometimes, hard. That's a kind of a subjective thing, right? But if you tell me that you are trusting Christ and his shed blood alone for salvation, I'm probably going to believe you. <laughs> I shouldn't say probably. I am. I'm going to believe you. I don't have any reason not to believe you. And I'm being a little, a little facetious, but this is really a serious matter. Anyone who believes who has not been baptized as a believer. Now, don't, don't hear me wrong. I know that there are people who disagree with this. And you know what? I, I can respect that. There are many people who have been baptized as an infant, and they believe that they're fine. And, and you know what? I, I would choose to disagree with that, but we can still be friends. I'm not going to let that affect my love for you, my respect for you. What I would say is make sure that you can prove it biblically. Make sure you can go back to Scripture and show me, okay, this is why I believe what I believe. And there are many. I grew up in a Christian Reformed church. Some of you did as well. That's what they believe. They believe that infants need to be baptized. It's part of the covenant family of God. That, that's harder to support. In the New Testament, I believe that any time baptisms are spoken of, it's believers who are baptized. Believers, sometimes it says, and their whole household, but I believe that that means that their whole household came to faith. Um, some You might disagree with that, and like I said, I'm still going to be your friend if you'll let me. Okay? So, who should be baptized? Anyone who believes who has not been baptized as a believer my view on baptism is not essential. This is not a essential. You know what I'm saying? I, I believe on non uh, I believe on the essentials, 
of our faith, then we need to agree. But on an issue like baptism, I don't, I don't believe it's an essential. And so, like I said, if we disagree, then we can still be friends, and we can still worship the Lord together. The biblical method of baptism, I believe the word baptize in scripture is, the Greek word is baptizo. Baptizo, you're not going to be impressed by that. That's just fine. Um, but it means to immerse or to dip under. Um, and once again, even the Lord himself being baptized in the Jordan River, I believe he was immersed fully and not sprinkled or poured on or, or whatever else methods um, maybe people use. Um, once again, I will not scoff at someone who believes differently than me. Um, I'm going to respect you completely. But this is what I believe about baptism, and I believe it's what this church believes about baptism. Um, and if it isn't, would someone come and tell me afterwards? <laughs> if you would like to follow the Lord in obedience, in being baptized— in demonstrating to the world that you have been joined to Christ, if you have union with Christ because of your faith, would you please come and talk to me after the service? That's it for my talk on baptism. I, I do want to say one more thing, though. This is a good sermon. Uh, after the service is over today, would you find someone... And would you say, how are you doing? Would you do that for me? Our, our tendency is to go get so wrapped up, and, and I'll be the first to admit, I'm, I'm in the same place as, as, as maybe you are. We get caught up in our own busy lives and what's going on after church, and the Vikings are on TV. We got to get going, right? I know you're not Vikings fans, but I am. But I want to just, I want to just say to you this morning, would you take a moment and would you ask someone, really, how are you doing? How are you doing with the Lord? I know it might be a little uncomfortable because this isn't normal. We don't necessarily talk this way all the time, but maybe we should. Maybe we should. Maybe we should take more time with each other and say, how can I pray for you? How can I pray for you this week? What do, you, what do you have going on? You know what? That's a thrill to be asked that question. I love it. Like I said, my tendency is to give you, I'm going to give you the whole story. If you ask me, you better, be, you better have some time because I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> it would be my desire as pastor of this church that we would be the priesthood of believers. Scripture tells us that's who we are. We are the body of Christ. My role as pastor is to equip this body. Ephesians chapter 4 tells me, and it tells you that too. Equip this body to do the works of ministry. What are the works of ministry? The works of ministry are ministering to each other by asking each other, how can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? Would you just take a moment and do that? I'm not going to hold a report card and, and see, oh, who's doing it? Who's, I'm not going to do that. But would you do that? Brother? Would you bow your heads now in prayer with me as we conclude our service? Father, we are so grateful that you have met here with us today. Dear Father, I'll be the first one to say my life has been changed because I believe that I have seen Christ this morning. And so I give you praise for that, Father. Would you help us as we go about this coming week that you would help us to fix our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorned in its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, where he is even now making intercession for us, making intercession for his bride, whom one day he will return for. That is good, good news. I pray that you would encourage us with this truth. And now, Father, I pray that you would help us as we seek to encourage each other, even as we ask, how can I pray for you? 
How are you really doing? We love you, Lord. We praise you for this time. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. And all God's people,